prosperity. Uh, I understand that you uh, have a story that came to you from your mother from an actual incident uh, during the Civil War. Uh, this uh, story is an actual incident is it, that took place during the war. Now, uh, first let me say, I believe you told me that your mother was a slave, was she? Yes. Uh, she was a slave, and uh, about what the year would you say that this uh, incident took place, approximately? Oh, I should say 1849. 1849, I see. And uh, where where was this? Uh, where were your parents living at this time? My mother was living at that time on Amelia Island, Fernandina, Florida, where she was born. And. Uh, she, um, she had this incident actually happen to her. She, it, she did. I that see. is, it's well, now, a real uh, story that and she a, heard. I see, it's, it is truly a real ghost story. It's a real it? ghost story. All right, well, now let us uh, just get this story recorded just exactly as you remember the way it was told to you, see. Now, what is your name? My name's Eartha M. M. White. And uh, your residence, uh, Miss White? Jacksonville, Florida, 611 West Ashley Street. I see. Well, now uh, go ahead and tell the story, please. Uh, during the days of slavery, uh, my mother was a house girl on this particular plantation on the Mealy Island, Fernandina, Florida. And while serving dinner, the early evening, one of the family came home, almost falling off of his horse, ran into the dining room, frightened everybody, and when he'd come to himself, he began to tell an experience he had on the road. He said just as he was coming down the big road not far from the cemetery, His aunt stopped the horse. It was, the horse was owned by her during her lifetime. The horse seemed to recognize her voice. He whickered. He said every strand of hair stood on his head. And then he heard someone stroking the horse. And then he heard her voice. She said to him, calling him by name, don't be afraid. She says, I want you to meet me tomorrow at sundown and told him just where. I have something for you. I am your aunt and gave your aunt and gave... Uh, this is a continuation of the uh, ghost story. Uh, on the preceding record, as related by Mrs. Ursula White of the of, uh, of the Carl White Mission, uh, the story having been told to her by her mother around 1849. Now, uh, Miss White, we got to uh, a place where you were uh, telling about. The aunt asking him not to be afraid that he was her aunt. Will you go on from there, please? Just as she finished, the heart became frightened, and he more so than ever. He ran home, fell almost out of his house in the dining room where they were eating, frightening everybody. When he had come to his cell, came to himself, they asked him, certainly you are going to hear what she has to say and to get whatever she has to give you. Then with a sigh, he said, not me. She can keep whatever she has. 
I'll not be there. Uh, this is a real story. My mother always delighted in repeating it. Thank you so much, uh, Miss White. That was awfully nice of you to go to all this trouble to give, this, uh, give us this story. So a little different start from us there. Obviously, that was neither Bond or I speaking. This was uh, some audio I found the other day. And let me explain kind of where we're at right now. In the past couple times we've sat and had a conversation, Bond and I have talked about our interest in kind of how these stories evolve, not just a single story and how it's retold and told again, but more about how ghost stories change in general over time. And I believe one of the things we talked about was how poltergeist seemed to both of us to be in the 1920s, a very modern sort of thing. So I was in that spirit trying to find an old account of a ghost story. And I thought it'd be interesting. You know, we, we like to interview people here. And of course, if you have a good story, we would like to interview you about that. And you can reach out to us. I'll ask Brendan where we can do that towards the end of the day here. So I was going through a bunch of audio recordings and field recordings specifically. And I found myself trolling through the Library of Congress as I do fairly, well, more often you, you probably believe me. <laughs> and I came across these few ghost stories by this lady, Eartha White, who you just heard speaking. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about Miss Eartha, as you did hear some of her story. She did talk about how her mother uh, had been born into slavery down in Florida, in Amelia Island. But I kind of wanted to tell you a little more. This isn't just typical person. This is a really interesting historical figure her mother's name is possibly more well-known in the state of Florida, but Eartha Mary Magdalene White was actually born in 1876 in Florida. She lived until 1974, just a couple years shy of her 100th birthday. Before the 20th century, she had been a classical opera singer and toured through America and Europe doing, well, opera. She turned her mother's soup kitchen, when she returned to Florida, she turned her mother's soup kitchen into a social agency, the Clara White Mission. This is down in the Jacksonville area, Jacksonville, Florida. And Clara White is her mother, her adoptive mother, and that agency is still existed today, and that's quite likely why Clara White, the mother's name, is possibly more well-known than Eartha White. But that's... Not saying a lot because Eartha White not only established a hospital, programs for boys to combat delinquency, programs for prisoners re-entering public society, she started a lot of different things. I can't, I'm not even going to list, but she is a hugely well-regarded humanitarian and philanthropist specific to the Florida area, but she had friends uh, in high places as well. Possibly a couple of the better known names would be Booker T. Washington was a friend of hers, as was First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. People down in Florida might be familiar when I drop the name Charles Bennett, who was Florida's longest serving U.S. representative. From 1949 until 1993, he served a total of 44 years, which in my book is too long to be serving, but that's me. That's me. Either way, so a really, just a really interesting person to start with. And I also want to mention that these recordings, I believe these were wire transcriptions. And of course, the recording itself has deteriorated. Well, it's been the better part of 60 some years. So it was really interesting not only to find these stories, but to find these stories of a childhood attached to such a figure as Eartha White. And if you're not familiar with Eartha M. M. White, like I said, that was a very quick rundown. I definitely wanted to kind of shine a light on her. You want to look her up. So 
having said all of that, having said the why, the who, oh, the when, those were recorded are in January of 1940. So already, Miss White has seen some things, she's done some things, and is known to the fine people in Florida. Brennan, what are you thinking? So I was really captivated by these recordings right off the bat. You know, we always say that some people just have like a gift for storytelling or a gift for, you know, public speaking in general. And uh, Eartha absolutely has whatever gift or uh, natural ability that is. Uh, as soon as you start in telling, the face of some deteriorated audio, yeah, like you just like I don't know. It was one of those things where listening to these recordings, um, she really pulls you in. She has a wonderful again. I I wasn't aware of the whole opera background, but it kind of makes sense because she just has such a wonderful voice, and um, how she goes about telling the stories is in such like a uh, there's a certain kind of like poetic nature to it i think and how she kind of rolls through certain things and where the beats in the story and even the sentences are sometimes so just like from a storytelling standpoint uh these were these are really fun to listen to i can't wait to go back and look at some of her other stuff to see what other recordings she has out there well as far as the library of congress these were the only well we have this story we have another one of hers that was relayed to her by her mother as well that we're going to share in a little bit. I do want to say, mm-hmm. if you do go to the Library of Congress, not only are there just a ton of audio recordings out there to listen to, but uh, if you <laughs> search her out, you'll you'll notice the sound quality is a little different. I did uh, spend a good bit of time trying to clean the audio up as best I could and so that it'd be a little more audible or a little more discernible. But like I said... Um, the recordings are a little rough for modern ears. I often forget that not everyone is like us in the sense that they're used to listening to 60, 70, 80 year old recordings on the reg. Um, (laughs) so, uh, yeah, the recordings are a little tough to listen to. If that's something you're not used to, you might have to go back and listen to it a time or two. But again, I just loved, I love the recordings and even the, uh, the gentleman, who was obviously a field recording expert at the, at the time. Uh, I thought he went about setting up the interviews and recording them very well because we have heard plenty of other field recordings throughout the years that were not done nearly as well. So the guy obviously knew what he was doing and w- took, took recording these stories seriously, um, which I Agreed. think, which, which I think shows showing that level of respect for like, you know, a ghost story or folklore at that time is really an interesting thing. I'd kind of like to hear that guy's story too, uh, because uh, he obviously had a reverence for what Eartha was talking about and really respected both her time and the stories that she was telling. When it comes to the actual stories themselves, though, this is a cool story. And so much of it reminds me of uh, fairy led stories where you have an apparition of some sort that gives you a quest or a command or says, be here at this time or follow me or gives you something that you need to do that you would normally do. And then promises you some sort of reward in this, in this case, it was a very ambiguous award. It wasn't like, Oh, treasure or uh, yeah. Gold or and something unlike like that. those stories too, the person was pretty clear in that he was not going to go back. That's what I loved about it. And that's kind of, I mean, it kind of, that lends a, like a level of, I don't know, credibility to the story because the romantic thing, the good storytelling thing to do would be like, Oh, well he does go back. And then what happens? But the fact that the guy came in the room and everyone's like, Oh, you have to go back. And he's like, I'm not, I'm not going back. Are you crazy? You know, like, <laughs> like that's a very real reaction, you know? And the, uh, the funny thing too, is that while both of her stories and the second story, we're, we're going to play for you in just a minute here. Both of her stories I felt ended really abrupt. I think the second story gives us a little bit of a non cicada at the end, and we're going to talk at length about that, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. But this first story has this, I agree, it, it has this real feeling of truth to it. Mm-hmm. As she builds, as she before she starts the story, she gives some of the background, her mother having heard it, um, living, it, you know, Mm-hmm. You know, and we talked about this. It, it, you had mentioned before we started recording just how really wild it is to be reminded of it really wasn't that long. Here's the daughter of a woman 
who was born in slavery yeah. and this lady passed away less than this daughter of this woman passed away less than 10 years before we were born mm -hmm. really kind of punctuates that but uh it, it it definitely makes it seem like hey this was a thing that really happened it really freaked everybody out it reminds mm -hmm. me not unlike your crackling white story which i believe you've <laughs> shared here before and i made you tell somebody else over the weekend but it, it was it, I'll, I'm, you're gonna tell it again right here so help me but let me give the 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 kind of the thing is brendan walked into a room turned on a light heard something and said no and left like it's a very abrupt story when yeah. it's told like that but. yeah but it's basically what happened long again not even long story short but just uh i walked into the building that we uh, spend lots of time at it's a very old historic building I walk in, I say good morning, as I do to the building whenever I show up, I turn the lights on, and the uh, industrial light that's like a, you know, like a sodium bulb at the top of the stairs crackles when it turns on, and the crackling almost sounded like the words, like the word, hello. I immediately turned the lights back off, said nope walked out, locked the door, and I left. And I believe I either called or texted you from the parking lot, Nick. Because <laughs> I, I yeah. was just like, I was just like, nope, I'm not, of all the things I was planning on dealing with this day, that's the not The funniest thing about that story to me is that not that you routinely say hello to the building, but when somebody responded, you freaked out. Yeah, like that, like, like that was the weird part. <laughs> No, because I just like I I, I do uh, generally. Uh, I mean, I kind of talk to myself when I'm doing things uh, in general. Little this little self narration, and uh, you know, it's not it's it's not uncommon for me to walk into a building and say, "Oh, hello," just in case there's anything there. You never know. You know, I'd rather be I, overly polite to anything that yeah. is there. You know, I remember reading in an oral history of Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg spoke. It was mm -hmm. quoted in the book as saying, you know. I remember walking through as I was leaving an apartment and I was moving out and I was saying goodbye to the apartment and Jack and mm -hmm. I were walking around doing that and they had kind of connected on that. They both did that same sort of thing. And I know I said in one of our Dr. Pennsylvania things that I feel like I am always saying goodbye mm -hmm. to things that are leaving. Mm -hmm. When it comes to this story and the abruptness again, like, like you said, we're going to play the other one here real quick. I think, and I just think generally speaking that tends to add credibility for me when I'm listening to other people's stories and it's not the, again, if you're going to make up a story, you, mm -hmm. you, you, you wouldn't go just halfway, you know, you'd, uh, yeah. you, you'd, you'd follow the full narrative because you know, that's less jarring for people. Therefore, it's less likely for them to question you on it, you know? Well, the real the real end of the story is just how frightened this person was. And exactly, yeah. If we want to talk about the evolution of this, uh, of how ghost stories began, I can see, uh, I, I know there's Resurrection Mary story, the famous, mm -hmm. I believe it's Chicago area cemetery where people see this phantom of a person as they're driving by and the mm -hmm. stories have been going on for generations now. It reminds me not unlike that story because there's a person passing a cemetery mm -hmm. and they hear they encounter this person that they know is deceased. Then you get the added element that you've alluded to is like a person, a phantom meets a fairy, meets a person mm -hmm. and says, hey, be here at this time in order to receive this thing. It, it does have a lot of elements that remain kind of consistent with stories that are still being told today. Of course, one of the differences, he's on a buggy mm -hmm. and not like driving by in a, a car. car. Um, now, one of the things <laughs> I want to. Oh, I'm sorry. No, Did yeah, you... no, just one, just one other thing. Is like you said, the at the time, you know, this guy was driving by in a buggy and everything. I wonder what the other lore they had around graveyards at the time. Because, um, you know, there's, I mean, again, just specifically from both like New England mythology and Celtic mythology, mm -hmm. we have a lot, we've adopted a lot of those kind of things from graveyards as far as like, um, 
spirits are contained within them sometimes. I mean, you have, you know, the like the rabbits that live in graveyards are, you know, are actually witch rabbits, you know, you have. Oh, I never of, heard that because I've been spooked oh, by rabbits and walking oh, through the cemetery. Late oh, at graveyard night. rabbits. Graveyard rabbits is a whole thing. Yeah. Oh, I was unawares and I'm glad I was. Yeah. Because when I realized what I had seen was a rabbit that jumped out at me, I was much more calm. One of the things I will say, kind of going back to the Resurrection Mary and the stories like it, of which there are many, is that with modern retellings, and by modern, I'm really anything post-1920 mm -hmm. for me is what I'm considering because I believe the Resurrection Mary stories go back to the 1940s, although I'm not entirely sure about that. The one element I am sure of, though, is that everybody's in a car. And, of mm -hmm. course, there's this various stories that if you pick her up, and she'll have you drive her somewhere to drop her off, and then she's gone when you look back. Again, I am sure there are many different stories that follow that same theme, but there is the theme of engagement. This story, because the person's on a buggy, you know, and it could be a simple buggy where he's completely exposed to the elements. Mm -hmm. He's just, you know, a cart. There isn't the need to invite engagement as when you're in a car, a closed That's true. vehicle, yeah. you have to invite the engagement. Otherwise, you're just driving by. And I'll say this one yeah. final thing. Uh, in our days of automobiles, I believe only then did we get the whole you know, folklore thing of you have to hold your breath as you pass a cemetery. Because mm -hmm. if you were in a buggy, passing some of the even moderate-sized symmetries oh, we have up here, oh, you it's would big deal. you would faint. Yeah, I, it's funny. I didn't realize that was like folklore until recently. I thought it because I like I that's something I've always done, and I didn't even know where I, where it came from. Like I didn't realize it was a thing other people even did. And uh, same with tunnels and bridges, uh, oh, which again, yeah, which, 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 which again around here, not easy. Um, well, yeah, and we famously here in the the Western PA Pittsburgh greater region had a, a bridge collapse on us. But you know, my mom didn't rid herself of this habit until she was in her like mid forties. But mm -hmm. anytime we'd go over a bridge over water, she mm -hmm. would crack her window a little bit, even just if it in was case. raining. Just in case. Yep. Uh huh. Because then Just she wouldn't case. have to wait for the pressure to. I used <laughs> so to. She could get I, out of a car if it fell in the water. I used to on my old one of my old commutes to work. I used to have to sit 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 on a large bridge, uh, for quite some time. Uh, most most days commuting to and from work, and it was one of those bridges that was big enough that it was normal for you to feel a little bit of up and down. You know, yeah. even when it wasn't windy. And um, yep. again, not someone who's afraid of bridges, but I would do the same thing as a habit all the time. So I'm like, eh, you know what? Just in case. Just in case. You never known true bridge fear unless you've driven across the Huey Long down in Louisiana. I'll tell you I've what, heard, that yeah, thing I've heard that. shakes. Well, there was that one up in uh, New York. I think, um, oh my goodness, um, it's it's a weird name, at least for me. Mm -hmm. But I think it's on Long Island. Oh my gosh, I forget the name. But they, I think it's been replaced because it was just a notorious bridge in the New York area, and I'm, I am killing myself to find a yeah. name. I'm gonna look it up real quick. Yeah, but there's Bear there's a lot there's a lot of folklore around bridges. We should do a bridge episode. That's not a bad idea. General. We are in the city yeah. of bridges. Yeah, but um, well, while you're looking that up, uh, Nick, how about if we go ahead and play the other story we have here okay and so everybody brace yourself because i'm going to have the name of this bridge and anybody listening in the york area is going to be really irritated with me in telling her tale or ghost story that had the moral in it to 
make a child tell the truth and behave. This particular story had a wonderful effect upon me. It was a girl who would not mind her mother, and she was determined to be bride in everything that came along, wagons and buggies and so forth. And this particular day, a man came along with a buggy, and she begged a ride. And as she traveled a distance, he said to her, Do you know where you are now, little girl? She said, I'm in my father's right here. He went on, Do you know where you are now? I'm in my father's watermelon patch. He went another distance. He said, Do you know where you are now? I'm in my father's watermelon patch. And came to your rabbit. So he went and told her father owns nothing. Then he jumped out of the buggy and he snatched her down into a great big hole. And when she got out in this hole, it was a room under the earth. And there he had a large pot with fire under it. He began stirring this pot. In a voice, he said, why, I'm going to put you in this pot. I'm going to boil you up so that you know how not to run away. And she began to scream and cry. And her pet cow came along, and he heard her voice down in this hole. And so he ran home, the cow, and the people were attracted by the Human motions of a cow, and they followed him back to this very hole, and there they heard her crying. Father reached down and he pulled her out of the hole and carried her home, and of course, naturally, she was frightened so that she was put in bed. The doctor came and quiet her nerves, and that next Sunday, here this strange man drove up to the door with that horse and buggy and inquired how she was. Mother saw him coming. And she had a kettle of hot water on the fire. And she ran to the door as he went to come in the house. And she threw that hot water in his face. And you know, that's why you see horses with white faces. That's the reason they have white faces. And from that time on, believe me, that little girl told the truth. I'll bet she did. Now, uh, where did you say you heard this? Uh, uh, how long ago? Or rather, how old were you when you heard this song first? I wouldn't mind telling you, but I was a very, very small child. Mother used to tell these stories of all kinds, most every night. She had a homemade story to tell. Of course, I've just realized that after I got larger. I don't mind telling you I was a very small child, but I wouldn't like to tell you how many years ago. I see. <laughs> now, uh, just for the sake of our record, uh, will you uh, just uh, let me have your name? Oh, my name's Eartha M.M. M. White, and my mother was Clara White. And she was a slave, and that was a method, you know, that... The method they had then to make the children go straight. I see. Now that is, uh, and uh, what is your address? Why? Why, I'm at 611 West Ashley Street at the Carl Hoyt Mission. I see. Well, thank you so much. We wanted to be sure to get that right in the record. All right, and for those of you who were playing at home, the name of the bridge that I could not remember, but I said it was a silly name to me, was the Tappan Zee Bridge. That is a silly name. There's no argument there. No argument there. Okay, Mind Your Mother. Now, this this is a very different story to me because mm-hmm. our first one, as you note, had a very real sort of feeling to it. This one... A bit less so. Mm-hmm. Tell me what you were thinking when you heard this. Yeah, one. I mean, so this one, this one is kind of like obvious. We talk about the per- a lot of times skeptics will use this as like 
oh, the whole purpose of all folklore is to keep kids safe, you know, to tell certain cautionary tales, which I... I completely agree that is a that is a large portion of why we have folklore in general. In this story, you have, you know, the whole point is the girl needs to tell the truth. And this is what happens when you don't, is all these, all this, this series of unfortunate events. Uh, which, again, has a very Faye-type feeling. Going underground, the cow friend, which is just adorable. Like, if they wanted, if Disney wanted to make a movie out of this one, I'd probably watch it. The whole arc of, you know, the, even how Eartha asks the question, do you know where you are? You know, like three times again, just beautiful storytelling, you know, um, it just feels, it just feels so rhythmic and natural. And then when, whenever they go into ground and you have the guy with the cauldron and everything, and that feels very fey just because you're going underground, you're going to the place of the fairy folk and the dead and you know the the other which is just you know a classic kind of thing to have happen like you wouldn't you wouldn't want her to go anywhere else to learn this lesson and to and to be any more further removed from uh her her natural world and then again she gets home and everything and you know learns her lesson which is great so my overall impression very fey very much a cautionary tale. <laughs> but the thing is, is I think a lot of times we see that these cautionary tales are rooted in some sort of truth. Uh, it has to be believable enough that even kids will, it might maybe be maybe a little fanciful, but it has to be believable enough that kids will understand it. So in this case, I wonder what the initial story was or initial happening that led to this being the impetus for this story. Because typically when you say, Hey, don't go into the, don't go into the woods because there's wolves, you know, that serves a, that serves a real purpose, but also there are wolves in the woods. Seriously. Don't go in there. I'd love to know where this story came from. And I wonder if there's any more, folklore from the area or the time or the culture that, yeah. that, that, that has maybe the same character. Well, there were two things that I thought of you know? with this. So, yeah. There were, there were two cautionary things that I could read this into. And again, it's a little bit because of the, you know, how the audio itself is deteriorated because mm -hmm. we talked about, we had some confusion of that, the horse having a white face thing yeah, we we thought that was kind of a non cicator. Maybe we we're just not very good listeners. Maybe it was a thing we just missed. But I felt that this was in part not lying to strangers, or, or not mm -hmm. not. Um, it was kind of the stranger concern, Stra but also stranger not being danger. boastful. Yeah. And mm -hmm. was she lying about? Yeah, I, no, no. Let me rephrase this. I thought like part of it could be a precautionary, you know, being around strangers, mm -hmm. people you don't know sort of thing. But the moral is clearly about being honest. And mm -hmm. so was it that she was being boastful because she kept saying like, this is her father's land. We're in my mm -hmm. father's watermelon mm -hmm. patch. And, you know, yeah. they kept walking and this is still my father's land. And then that made her a target sort mm -hmm. of. Was it that sort of thing? See, I, I didn't really even think about that. That's, a, that's an interesting. That's an interesting take on it. I hadn't. Even, you're right. They did make a. They did make a a, a point of of that element of it. Um, well, I remember reading in the Vanishing Hitchhiker, which mm -hmm. I think it was published in the late '70s, early '80s, and it took mm -hmm. a lot of these folk tales, and it talked about maybe some of the meanings behind them. One of the most popular stories that I heard when we were growing up was a variation of the hook thing where two, and this was in The Vanishing Hitchhikers, I recall, mm -hmm. but two young people go up to a lover's lane sort of place. Yeah. They have the radio on. The radio interrupts with, hey, there's a madman that got out. He has one hand as a hook. Yeah. And the lady, can't, they, they carry on necking as they, mm -hmm. the term was. As, as they do. As, as one does, the, the lady hears something and he's like, it's nothing. She keeps hearing it. So he goes, mm -hmm. either he goes and then never comes back or they decide to drive away, depending on the version of the story you're hearing. Yeah. And when they get back, they see a hook 
attached or, to the side of the car or something like that. Yeah. Right. And the stories, it's, yeah, you can enjoy it as a creepy story, but the message was clear. Like, you shouldn't go out and be mm-hmm. necking in the car unsupervised lane. like that. Yeah. So, yeah, and exactly. I, I think that was a story that yeah. definitely came out of automobile culture. So I put that really mm-hmm. 1920s on. That that story could have happened like any time. Any time, yeah. It, or it could have happened with the horse and buggy. Like you were saying, you know, um, but it's interesting because there are, there are, there is folklore that has these cautionary tale elements like that, but then look at something that is probably just as popular, like a crybaby bridge type story, or one of my favorites is the, is the railroad, the, the railroad track stalling stories where yeah, you have the kids who got hit, push you yeah, off by the bus and they push you off kind of thing. I mean, there's no real cautionary tale element to those ones but they do exist in the same in the same space there is definitely an entertainment and rite of passage i would say element to some of these but like you said with like the like the mass murderer with a hook for a hand like that one clearly like you said is to keep people out of lovers lanes you know just like a lot of you know these stories are you know for keeping kids safe and near the home or not lying, you know, any kind of fable is going to, is going to take maybe your natural inclination and tell you why your natural inclination is wrong and why you should be virtuous. Why you should be virtuous. Yeah. So uh, going back to that, I read it as here's a child because she lied, you know, you could look at it that this person was punishing her. You could look at it. For lying, because he knew you could look at it as she became boastful, so it made her mm-hmm. a target. Like, if yeah. you brag about all the awesome stuff you have in your house, and then your house gets robbed because yeah. you were bragging about all that awesome stuff, and mm-hmm. somebody heard you who shouldn't have. Yeah. It teaches people about, like, the banality of evil in the sense that, like, you don't have to be doing something that you think is like a really, really bad thing to invite negativity to, Mm. to warrant something bad happening to you. It's not always this one-to-one. And I think that this story is a good version is a good excuse is a good way of showing that. Cause like you said, like being boastful, being, you know, lying, you know, all those kind of things are just not only unvirtuous, but at a time could be dangerous and probably somewhere in the middle. It was just uncouth. You know, so the pet cow brings the people to the girl. They get mm-hmm. her out. Later, it seems it sounds like if I heard the story correctly, mm-hmm. this fella comes back pretending he didn't have anything to do with this. She throws hot water on him, and that's why horses have white faces. That was yeah, that was the thing that we were both kind of confused on, and it's one of those things where I listening listening back to the tape and everything. I think there's either two major possibilities. One, there is some cultural reference th- that we just don't get because we're so far re- removed from the culture. Yeah, from the time uh, and the place. The t- yeah, and- yeah. Or what is also just as likely, I think, given the fact that these are probably old wire recordings, the odds of us uh, missing something in there, just even if it was a sentence or two that would make that make sense, is also just as likely because... When it comes to archiving these kinds of things, it's not like they got the wire recordings, you know, ripped them straight to digital, and then me and Nick got them. Um, or even they've just probably having, been... like, a glass master of something. Exactly, they probably, yeah. They, they like, probably haven't been stored the best at all yeah, times. Yeah, like, all yeah, there's there's a lot of things, a lot of re-editing that could have happened. And even the versions, you, like, like just to be just to be clear, we are going to uh, give credit in the, the uh, show notes here. But me and Nick have edited these files just so they're a little easier to listen to. So they are, they aren't in their original form. The original form is much, much harder to listen to. So yeah, either we missed something or we missed something. <laughs> One way or the other, because yeah, it doesn't, the whole uh, horse having a white face thing doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Yeah. I think I described it to you before we started recording is it's like hearing a person tell the firsthand account of the Hinder- Hindenburg disaster and then explaining that that's why ducks have webbed feet. It was a bit of a non-cicator. I even speculated, did she say, like, haint? Like, 
you know, ghosts and we heard it as horse or maybe like, that's, yeah, that's, that's possible too. Yeah. That's, that's possible too. Yeah. I mean, cause I'm, she said the man showed up again. I don't know if she said on a buggy or anything or on a horse. So yeah, may, maybe she was using a word like haint or something similar. Uh, or maybe it even, could have even been a slang term at the time that we just, again, don't know. Could be the Sound like horse. Sound like horse. You know, I heard horse. Um, yeah, I heard horse too. Either way, like again, um, I, I just thought it was. I, I agree. This is just really interesting stories, and I think it leads to a lot of um, good context for how folklore can you know kind of change or doesn't change so much over time. Because, like you said, a lot of the, like like these stories. Uh, could take place almost whenever. Yeah, variables change. The buggy yes. to the automobile, but mm -hmm. the theme seems to... I mean, the the, uni, the concept of universal themes remains exactly. there. And I, exactly, and I think that's why we listen to ghost stories or any kind of, any kind of paranormal story. Whenever we hear a story for the first time, I know a lot of us in our heads are kind of constantly going through some of these different check boxes when we hear a story and go, okay, yeah, that's, that lines up with this, this lines up with that. And so it's funny because so, like, like I said, sometimes it can add credibility if you're like, yeah, that sounds exactly like how these kinds of stories usually go. And that can, that can add credibility sometimes, or it can hinder the story other times where you're like, Hmm. Not say this person made it up, but are they confusing it with other things that they maybe have heard previously? Yeah. The bottom line is it's really interesting to hear these stories. That first ghost story is told to us, and it's said that the story took place 1849, 1850. The second one possibly a little later. It's just really interesting to hear a voice from the past like that. And again, mm -hmm. this er Miss Eartha White, definitely a person, a figure. If you're not already familiar with her, chances are you're not. Definitely an interesting person worth looking up who, whose life should be a bit celebrated for all the work she did. For the people of Florida specifically, yeah. If you have a uh, story you'd like to share with us or uh, want to chat with us... Uh about you know really anything paranormal uh you can reach out to us on instagram and facebook at the ghost furnace podcast or you can just email us at the ghost furnace podcast at gmail.com and i did want to say that we have been uh seeing uh more reviews come in we really appreciate that um that's like the best way um to help us as uh, leaving those leaving those reviews and comments, the only thing that's better is sharing this with someone else. Uh, if you know someone else out there who either has a story or just would maybe like to hear hear what we're saying, uh, please share it with uh, with uh, someone. And uh, we have some more things coming down coming down the line here. And uh, we don't say thank you enough, I think, uh, to everyone out there who's listening. Uh, we really do appreciate it, and we're, we're really thankful that you take the time to listen to us. And anybody who's emailed us knows that usually it's mostly me responding to the emails, and I yes. usually do it at almost concerning speed because we just <laughs> do really enjoy getting that. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night, everyone.